Sahana Bhavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahavir Yankaravai, Tejasvinav Aditamastu, Mavid Vishavai, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. May the divine being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the divine being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Well, good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, happy Halloween. Uh, Halloween has more significance than we might think. Uh, some of us know that, but uh, if you don't know about that, next week I will uh, offer a talk on the deep significance of Halloween and its uh, ancient roots in uh, Sanatana Dharma, actually. So happy Halloween and good morning. Uh, there really are no announcements to make other than that, uh, except that uh, we, of course, will continue to meet on Zoom as long as this Delta variant of the uh, virus uh, continues to be an issue and there are breakthrough uh, uh, infections. It's, uh, it's a shame we can't meet face to face, but uh, I think it's better to be that we err on the side of caution. I wanted to finish this month with uh, a talk on uh, Sri Krishna's explanation of the devotional path. October has been a month for study of bhakti yoga. A bhakti yogi, bhakta, has a devotional relationship with God. This is developed over time by study, prayer, ritual, and worship. And if you want to know what I mean by those four terms, please look uh, in either Swami Vivekananda's or Swami Prabhavananda's uh, translation and commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and see what is said about the Niyamas, the observances uh, that uh, that uh, Patanjali recommends, and th so those are those will serve as a good definition of what is meant here by study, prayer, ritual, and worship. As a mature bhakta, you may enjoy seeing everything in the universe as the work and glory of your divine beloved. This includes yourself. And so you give every action, thought, emotion, perception, and tendency a Godward turn. Your prayer is for the carefree self-surrender of a child in its mother or father's arms and ultimately union with your beloved. Now, as far as prayer goes, it need not be complicated. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's probably probably better if it is not. Uh, so this little song will give you an idea of what is meant by prayer. This is titled A Devotee's Prayer. O oh Lord, take my hand, 
Oh, Lord, take my hand. Without thee I may fall. Without thee I may fall. Oh, Lord, pull me on. Oh, Lord, pull me on. Without thee I may stray. Without thee I may stray. O oh Lord, take my hand. O oh Lord, pull me on. Without thee I may fall. Without thee I may stray. O oh Lord, draw me near. O oh Lord, draw me near. Thou art my all in all. Thou art my all in all. Without thee I may fall. O oh Lord, take my hand. O oh Lord, pull me on. O oh Lord, draw me near. Thou art my all in all. Thou art my all in all. Thou art my all in all. Without thee I may fall. O oh Lord, fill this heart. O oh Lord, fill this heart. O oh Lord, fill this heart, O oh Lord, fill this heart. Thou art my all in all, Thou art my all in all. Without Thee I may fall. Om, Amen. So the topic this morning is Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 12, The Yoga of Devotion. And as I have been saying uh, in the past weeks, please understand that this is not meant as personal instruction for you. This is an explanation of the devotional path according to Sri Krishna's uh, explanation in chapter 12 of the Gita. If there is something here that appeals to you, very well and good, uh, take it to your heart. If this is not for you, well, this is why there are the four yogas. Uh, Swami Vivekananda pointed out the goal of human life is to manifest the divinity within ourselves. And he said, do this by work, worship, psychic control, or philosophy, one or more, or all of these, and be free. This is the whole of religion. So the four yogas that he mentions, work is karma yoga, worship, bhakti yoga, psychic control, raja yoga, and philosophy, jnana yoga, or advaita. We take, take up one of those each month. Uh, this is the concluding talk on bhakti, uh, the yoga of devotion. <clears throat> and so here we go. <clears throat> Arjuna, is warrior chief of the Pandava clan and a disciple of Sri Krishna. They are also close friends and comrades at arms. In chapter 5 of the Gita, Krishna reveals the truth of his being when he tells Arjuna, I am the birthless, the deathless. In every age I come back to deliver the holy, to destroy the sin of the sinner, to establish righteousness. He then describes his divine manifestations and attributes and concludes, whatever in this world is powerful, beautiful, or glorious, that you may know to have come from a fraction of my power and glory. I'm going to repeat that because it's so central to what we're going to discuss. Whatever in this world is powerful, beautiful, or glorious, that you may know to have come from a fraction 
of my power and glory. This redefinition of their relationship eventually leads to Arjuna's question, which opens chapter 12 of the Gita. His question is, some worship you with steadfast love. Others worship God, the unmanifest and changeless. Which kind of devotee has the greater understanding of yoga? Sri Krishna's straightforward answer is the subject of this morning's talk. Sri Krishna tells Arjuna, those whose minds are fixed on me in steadfast love, worshiping me with absolute faith, I consider them to have the greater understanding of yoga. As for those others, the devotees of God, the unmanifest, indefinable and changeless, they worship that which is omnipresent, constant, eternal, beyond thought's compass, never to be moved. They hold all the senses in check. They are tranquil-minded and devoted to the welfare of humanity. They see the Atman in ever, every creature. They also will certainly come to me. But the devotees of the unmanifest have a harder task because the unmanifest is very difficult for embodied souls to realize. Quickly I come to those who offer me every action, worship me only, their dearest delight, with devotion undaunted. Because they love me, they are my bondsmen, and I shall save them from mortal sorrow and all the waves of life's earthly, uh, of life's deathly ocean. I shall save them from mortal sorrow and all the waves of life's deathly ocean. Be absorbed in me, lodge your mind in me. Thus you shall dwell in me. Do not doubt it here and hereafter. So this is Sri Krishna's answer to Arjuna's question. Is it the devotional path or the path of philosophy? The followers of which path have the greatest understanding of yoga? And Sri Krishna says, that it is the followers of the path of devotion. And he explains that the reason is that there are very few who can follow the path of philosophy, of Advaita, because it is so hard for embodied souls to realize that divinity. Those who do, of course, are transcendent, and it has been remarked uh, that the two paths meet at the summit, so to speak. They are one and the same. But before we go on, are there any comments from your own wisdom or experience that you'd like to offer? Or any concern you'd like to raise or any question you'd like to ask? This is how we study the art of spirituality together. We share ourselves uh, and our wisdom, our concerns, and our questions. So is there anything at all about what was said? Brother Shankar? Yes. I have a question. He was talking about, uh, he was saying that he would save us from the, the deaths and all that. What I'm confused about is if we are one with Brahman, then what are we in danger from and what is he saving us from? <clears throat> well, 
I'll just speak for myself, uh, Frank. Uh, I experience deep anguish sometimes uh, about the spiritual path, uh, about my participation in it, and also about other people and their struggles. It is only through prayer and through meditation that I feel the saving grace of the divine presence as it is known to me. So we are both, we have, as we as was said, we have our membership, our citizenship, so to speak, in both the divine, as you just described it, and in the relative plane as an embodied being. Sri Krishna is saying, I'll save you from the anguish, from the pain of uh, the embodied soul. But you're quite right, we are the divine, so what is there to save us from? This, of course, is one of the key concepts of jnana yoga. You were never bound. You were never, you were never in all this pain and suffering is a mirage. And yet, as Sri, as Adi Shankaracharya freely points out, the great one of the greatest philosophers of the Advaita path. He freely points out that we do experience the pain. It's a superimposition, he says, but in his song Bhaja Govindam, he says, take refuge in Krishna. So uh, there'll be a comment later about what happens to us. Uh, and how these things resolve themselves. But thank you for bringing up that question, Frank, and it's a very perceptive one. Did that uh, answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. And I, I meant it, it's a very perceptive question. What are we to be saved from? Anyone else have any question or comment or wisdom to offer? Okay. In chapter 12, Sri Krishna then describes in detail what happens to you when you pray for this deeply devotional relationship with him and make it the focus of your daily life. I'm going to repeat that. Sri Krishna then describes in detail what happens to you when you pray for this deeply devotional relationship with him as the divine presence and make it the focus of your daily life. Now we all know what the focus of your daily life means. It means daily practice. Krishna promises you will become these are Krishna's promises in chapter 12 of the Gita. He promises you will become pure and independent of the body's desire, able to deal with the unexpected, prepared for everything, unperturbed by anything. These, is, these are his words. Neither vain nor anxious about the results of your actions, he says, such a devotee is dear to me. He goes on, you will not desire or rejoice in what is pleasant. You will not dread what is un unpleasant or grieve over it. You remain unmoved by good or evil fortune. Such a devotee is dear to me. Your attitude is the same toward friend and foe. 
you are indifferent to honor and insult, heat and cold, pleasure and pain. You are free from attachment. You value praise and blame equally. You can control your speech. You are content with whatever you get. Your home is everywhere and nowhere. Your mind is fixed upon me and your heart is full of devotion. You are dear to me. This true wisdom I have taught you will lead you to immortality. The, fa the, faithful, the faithful practice it with devotion, taking me for their highest aim. To me, they surrender heart and mind. They are exceedingly dear to me. So I'm going to go back and, and go through these. <clears throat> Sri Krishna promises that if you do what he says, you make this relationship with him, of course he's speaking as the divine being. If you make it the center of your life and work toward it, slowly and slowly, these, these are the things that will happen. As he says in chapter 6, holiness itself will transform you. What do we mean by transform? It means that every cell in our body becomes different. Not just the neurons of our brain, not just the fibers of our nervous system. Every cell in our body changes. And it happens slowly and slowly. We are eons old. We came to this condition because as the divine being, we wanted this experience of relative existence, duality. But when we are devoted on the devotional path, because we now seek this surrender, this carefree self-surrender of a child in its mother or father's arms, and ultimately union with the beloved, then we're willing to do what's necessary to have that be a reality for us, the reality. And so Krishna says, this is what will happen. You will become pure and independent of the body's desire. As Sri Chaitanya says in the very opening lines of his prayer, Sri Chaitanya, is regarded as another incarnation of Krishna at the late at the end of the 14th and beginning of the 15th century uh, our time current era Sri Chaitanya's prayer says chant the name of the Lord and his glory unceasingly that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quenched that mighty forest fire, worldly lust, raging furiously within. Now, chant the name of the Lord and his glory unceasingly. This is Sri Chaitanya's prescription for how to uh, achieve these two great goals. And unceasingly means daily, even and during a day, the recollectedness as, as 
often as you can. And of course, he's talking about chanting a mantra, chant the name of the Lord and his glory, the, the, the mantras that we're taught contain both of those things. So if you strive toward this relationship with Sri Krishna, with the divine being, as you love and understand it, it doesn't matter if you call it Krishna, doesn't matter by which name you call it, as again Chaitanya's prayer says, various are thy names, O Lord. In each and every name, thy power resides. So however you understand the divine and relate to it and strive for the relationship with it, you will become pure and independent of the body's desire able to deal with the unexpected, prepared for everything, unperturbed by anything. Now, this is the very definition of a yogi, according to Patanjali. Prepared for anything, prepared for everything, unperturbed by anything simply because they have no attachments. Neither vain nor anxious about the results of your actions. <clears throat> of course, this is one of the key concepts that Sri Krishna teaches. Give it all to me. All this anxiety, all this concern about the results, just turn it all over to me as the divine being. I'm the author of it anyway, he says. So why hang on to it and why be subject to its results? And he says that a, that a devotee who is becoming accomplished in these three things just mentioned, such a devotee is dear to me. So what does it mean if you're dear to him? He goes on to say, you will not desire or rejoice in what is pleasant. You will not dread what is unpleasant or grieve of it. You remain unmoved by good or evil fortune. <clears throat> so this is what you become. You will not desire or rejoice in what is pleasant. It doesn't mean you don't enjoy it, but you don't seek it. And when it comes, you don't rejoice in it. You simply enjoy it. And as Christ said, you pass on, you are a passerby. And so Krishna then repeats, you will not dread what is unpleasant or grieve over it. You remain unmoved by good or evil fortune. And then he repeats, such a devotee is dear to me. That relationship is dear to the divine presence. Your attitude is the same toward friend and foe. Your attitude is the same toward friend and foe. That is very difficult indeed. I speak from very deep experience in that. Your attitude is the same toward friend and foe. You are indifferent to honor and insult. Again, very difficult. You're indifferent to heat and cold, pleasure and pain. In other words, none of the opposites. It isn't that you don't feel them. You're simply indifferent toward what you experience. You don't become 
obsessed by pleasure, you don't become obsessed by aversion to displeasure or unpleasantness. <clears throat> So you're indifferent to honor and insult, heat and cold, pleasure and pain. You are free from attachment. You value praise and blame equally. Now I can tell you, honestly, this is something that is struggled with here. There's still an ego bone that desires recognition and wants praise. And of course, once you're in that position, you're averse to blame. Hmm? You value praise and blame equally and control your speech. <clears throat> How do you control your speech? By controlling your thoughts. <clears throat> you are content with whatever you get. This is the very definition of the, of the that great qualification of the spiritual aspirant, Santosha, contentment. You are content with whatever you get. Your home is everywhere and nowhere. Oh my God. What? I mean, that shakes most of us. Your home is everywhere and nowhere. You're not attached to the things that you own or the place that you live in. Your mind is fixed upon me and your heart is full of devotion. So that's what replaces all of these other things. Your mind is fixed on me and your heart is full of devotion. You are dear to me. This true wisdom I have taught will lead you to immortality. This true wisdom I have taught he says to Arjuna, who is every person, Arjuna is our every person, this true wisdom I have taught will lead you to immortality. What is immortality? It means no longer needing to take the limitations of human form. All of participation in Time, space, and causation is limitation. One of its greatest embodiments of that limitation is the human form. This true wisdom I have taught will lead you to immortality. The faithful practice it with devotion, taking me for their highest aim. To me, they surrender heart and mind. They are exceedingly dear to me. Now, whatever is exceedingly dear to us, we love unconditionally and will do anything to protect them and be of service to them. So this is Krishna's promises. These are Krishna's promises. Are there any comments from your own experience or wisdom or anything you'd like to add in the way of a concern or any question you'd like to ask about what's been said? And can you hear me? Yes, we can, Tom. So I can really relate to what you said about praise and blame. Uh, the thing I've noticed in myself, I almost always have multiple motivations for anything I do. Uh, 
there's a number of different drives in action. So I have multiple motivations and I'm almost always notice the one that's the most flattering to me mm -hmm. and uh, am less likely to notice the less flattering ones. And mm -hmm. the thing I notice with uh, like doing good for other people, I have a genuine desire to do good for other people and it makes me happy to do good for other people. That's a genuine motivation, but also I have the motivation to look good and I'm less likely to uh, notice the motivation to look good. And then when I do notice it, I feel bad about it. But <laughs> right now, I'm just kind of accepting it as part of human nature. It's part of who I am. It's part of what almost everybody is. And, and, yes. uh, I'm not going to stop doing good stuff because it feeds my ego. I'll just be aware that it feeds my ego, but it also does some good. So that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Tom. And as usual, your straightforwardness and your sincerity are a great of great use to all of us. Because, as you said, what you're experiencing is definitely what you termed part of human nature. This sense of separateness, this sense of I need to be special. Oh my goodness, it's so insidious. As you said, multiple motivations. Yes, that's the good reason. What's the real reason? <laughs> that was a question I was asked often in my youth. Anything else from anyone? Namaste, brother. This is Stephen. Yes, Stephen. I just want to say, um, as a word of encouragement, uh, that um, having faith and believing and putting forth effort brings results. And um, as you say often, it's simple, but not easy. Mm -hmm. Practice, practice, practice. I can see how I have had more peace in my own life and been able to um, uh, respond better to difficult situations. Um, and uh, I also see that when I'm drifting away and not practicing, how much more I struggle to respond to difficult situations. So um, I I know that what you're saying um, uh, works. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, it, indeed. And of course, it's not what I'm saying. It's what the great teachers and in incarnations have left to us as, as uh, reassurance. But you're absolutely right. The wisdom is within us. Vivekananda said over and over. It's all there within you. Just stop looking outside, start looking inside, and you will find it. And when we find it, as you pointed out, life becomes easier in the sense that we are able to deal with things more dispassionately and more efficiently, both of which are a great benefit to Thank you, Stephen. Anyone else? This is great. This is what we're doing. I would like to uh, offer some of my observations. Please. Um, to me, Bhagavad Gita offers <coughs> always which I call four facets of our approach to God, our relationship with God. Bhakti Marg is the emotional connection <coughs> with God. By the way, Patanjali says, and which you often describe as prayer, worship, rituals, whichever singing 
or just rushing to God to unload your troubles. See in God your greatest comforter, <laughs> your greatest supporter who holds you just like mother or father. So that's an emotional way of connecting with God. Jnana, on the other hand, is an uh, intellectual way because there we keep on reading, reflecting, contemplating, meditating. So, and as Gita says, Krishna says over and over, is not for all and it's rather difficult. But those who keep on without getting impatient, the result is wisdom. And that wisdom is offered by our Upanishads. All Upanishadic teaching, I would say, is geared toward Gyan Markis, those who pursue Gyan Mark. The third, the karma away, is actually putting in practice, action. That whatever you have thought, whatever you feel, just go ahead and do it. Give it back. Give it back to community. Give it back to God. But the caveat is, <laughs> As uh, uh, Tom was saying, am I doing it for my own glory? Am I doing it to get famous? Am I doing it to get publicity and good remarks? Or am I truly selfless? And it takes years and years and not every time we succeed, but still I feel <laughs> regardless of ego, of course, as Gandhiji said, reduce your ego to a zero. But until his death, he also confessed that he had not been able to cut down his ego totally. So well, we yes, the, I, but let, let me just interpolate here, just a moment, Uma. Yes. One cannot serve in the way. The Sri Ramakrishna points this out over and over. One cannot serve in the way that Gandhiji did without a, some small thread of ego of knowledge and ego of love. Yes. It's, it's, it's just not possible. So right. pardon the interruption, but I, I wanted to point that out. Yes. That it, it, there has to be it's like Swami Bhaskarananda said one time to one of the devotees who was visiting. Swami Bhaskarananda heads the center in Seattle, the Ramakrishna Mission Center there. He said, Mother has left just this much ego in me so that I can run the center. Mm -hmm. Right, you're right. And that's how Gandhiji realized at the end that regardless of whatever little a uh, residue of ego is very natural. But the point is in making a continuous, constant effort to cut it down as much as possible. And the last one is Dhyana Marga. And that is meditation going inward and, and making yourself the best and the strongest equipment to worship God. So it is, I would say, self, not realizing, but self-training, self-disciplining by japa and by dhyana and uh, whatever is your practice. So wonderfully said. All these four are complementary, and I all I can do is to do whatever suits my nature, because we all are different. Yeah, we are not just different, we are unique. Oh. We are each unique. Thank you. So this is my approach. It's a four-fingered approach, 
which I think I love every other religion, but the way Krishna uh, uh, puts it, or the writer of Gita puts it in Bhagavad Gita, is so powerful because it is available to everyone, whoever, by whichever way you come, Krishna says, I accept you all. And that gives me such a relief, comfort, that whatever I am capable of, I'm putting it out there. And thank, thank you, Uma. So, so very nicely said. So very, and uh, we can all take uh, heart from what she's saying about our uniqueness and for us to find our own way. That's why I said at the beginning of this talk, this is not meant as personal instruction for you. This is whatever appeals to you, take from it. Uh, these are the promises that Krishna makes. And uh, if we believe in the incarnations of God, we, we understand they have the power to keep those promises. As a matter of fact, they are the power that is um, not just making the promises, but creating the entirety of our experience. So anything else from anyone? Brother Shankara? Yes, Nira. Yes, uh, could you expand a little bit more on that? You said something about home uh, is everywhere and anywhere? Is everywhere there... and nowhere. Yeah. Uh, I think we all know what that means. Everywhere uh, and nowhere, but... Uh... Yeah, let, let, let me just say these words about it. Let me find the exact quote. Ah, you are content with whatever you get. Your home is everywhere and nowhere. It doesn't mean that you have no home. It simply means that you're not attached to any particular home and the things that you possess there. You are content with whatever you get. So if your home if your home is modest, small, yeah. simple, you're content with that. If yes, I was fact, just relating to that that for myself, it's not the type of home. It, it, it's it's how I get peace of mind in my own home that I don't get outside the home. Wherever I may be traveling, when I come to my home it gives a certain peace of mind and also going to the shrine then it gives me you know so yes, i was listening yes. to that and when sri krishna is saying that as you are transformed in the ways that he's talking about you will find that contentment and that uh solace in whatever home Somebody has their mic on. Okay. Thank you, Nira. You're absolutely right. Home is, uh, uh, this is one of the reasons that Krishna mentions it. You say home, sweet home, you know, like when you come yes. back home oh, after yes. Yes. going yes. everywhere and anywhere in the whole world and you come back to your own home, no matter yeah. how, what it is, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It gives you a certain relief and comfort. Hang on just a minute. Uh, yeah. Some, okay. Someone oh. has their mic open Tom and we're Tom hearing Tom. the conversation in the background. Tom walked away from his computer and he's, I think he's talking to someone on the phone. <laughs> I don't think oh. he is in the room. Can, can you can you mute his uh, 
not without logging out and logging back in as you okay do. very good okay i can call him and <laughs> or send him a text I'll do that. Okay. yeah send him a text would you I think he's on the phone, yeah. Okay. So any anything else from anyone before we go on? Brother Shankara? Yes. Uh, two quick comments. Uh, she was just saying about wherever you're traveling in the world and when you come home, you're back home. Um, I took it as a little deeper that wherever you're traveling in the world, you still are home. That's what Krishna means, yes. Yeah, that's how. And when you said that part about um, accepting good news and bad news the same, I find it interesting that I'm able to do that for other people, but not so much for myself. <laughs> ah, yes. Yes, yes. We, it's easy to understand it conceptually. Much harder to live it. You're absolutely right, Frank. So thank you for that. Yes, and, and that's what Krishna does mean. Uh, that wherever you are, you're at home. If your mind is lodged in him, rather than in the things that <clears throat> are, that surround you as your, as Nira put it, your home, sweet home. If your home is the divine presence, then you are at home wherever you are. Again, this is not something that can achieve, be achieved by willing it. Okay. One prays for it, one it becomes transformed to that, to that state of awareness, that state of being through the, through the grace of the divine being, as you, as it is said, lodge yourself. In, in, that, in that being. I'm finding it very distracting to have because Tom's voice is so um, could, could you could you log out and then log back in Cindy is, and turn him off? Yo Tom we all hear you can you go on mute please? I just muted him. I just logged out and logged back in. Thank you. He will get it. Okay. All right. Is there anything else from anyone? This is wonderful. This is what we're here for, to share with one another in this way. All right. Um, uh, Brother Shankar, the second point was you were reading something about you're prepared for the unexpected. Yes. But if your mind is already evolved high enough that you're not affected and you're in, you know, equanimity, then uh, you're already prepared for the unexpected, right? Well, no, no, this is something that, that happens slowly and slowly over your spiritual journey, dear. None of this is something that we jump from square one to the center square of the game board. No, no, it's something that comes slowly and slowly as as every cell in our body is transformed by the by the spiritual practice so it, it isn't uh, it's like yeah. swami prabhavananda remarked to swami turiyananda when they were going over the qualifications of being a student of advaita vedanta as defined by adi shankara acharya and swami prabhavananda went away and and thought about it and studied a bit more. And he came back to Turiyananda and he said, well, if you embody all these, you've already reached the goal. And, and Turiyananda says, ah, I see who you have solved the riddle. It, but it doesn't happen all at once. We become qualified by wanting to become qualified and then working to attain those qualifications and it seems as if we're doing it krishna says no it's, it, it isn't you who's doing it it's me who's doing it 
but Thanks. so now uh, there isn't going to be enough time to read something that I have here from Richard Rohr. But if you want to, it's called Richard, it's from Richard Rohr, Father Richard Rohr, and it's called Being in Love, and it's from one of his books, and it's well worth your reading if you want to go to the notes afterwards. Okay. Hmm? Can you spell the name, please? Oh, uh, R-O-H-R, -R, Richard Rohr, Father Richard R-O-H-R. -R. Okay. But you can find it if you just go to the notes. Uh, uh, the notes are downloadable. Uh, but I do want to read something else. What it what it uh, what it is. Uh, what the Roar talks about is how to see, as Krishna says to see. It's from his book, The Naked Now learning to see as the mystic see. But I do want to read this. If we want to understand how this actually happens, here is a poem about why and how an incarnation of the divine being comes to live with us. The writer's experience of Ramakrishna as such an incarnation and the pure, motiveless and spontaneous love that flows toward the beloved when that experience is bestowed. And Sri Krishna in chapter 10 the chapter on divine glory says, it is by me only that these experiences and attributes are given. So that's what I meant by it is by the grace that we achieve this. But here is a poem titled From the Infinite to the Finite. And it's by Swami Premeshananda, the disciple of Holy Asa, disciple of Holy Mother, and uh, a very great teacher of my teacher, Swami Swahananda, the center, the Swami who sent me here. Uh, so here is the poem by Swami Premeshananda. Under the gentle breeze of mercy, waves have risen in the ocean of formlessness, <clears throat> merged in the undivided, without beginning or end. Thou, through thine inscrutable power, has assumed a human form. On the side of the mind, there is a realm unknown where neither sun nor moon can enter. But even there, the infinite smile sheds thine infinite smile. But even there, thine infinite smile sheds its rays and lumens with charming light. Thy body is made of love and puts to shame the god of beauty and what sweet light thine eyes bestrew whoever sees thee longs to offer at thy feet whoever sees thee longs to offer at thy feet his body life and mind many ages come and gone have awaited thee but today all doubts have vanished. Oh, receive the gift of all I have. I dedicate my life to serve thee. Now, this is the experience of one who makes that start 
nurtures that spark of divine fire within and then is rewarded with these experiences of the divine. What do I mean by nurturing this spark of the divine fire? According to Sri Ramakrishna, he says this many times in the gospel. The Lord's attention is attracted by your yearning, by your earnest desire for his attention. The master invites you to weep for God, one sincere tear. The master invites you to weep for God, just one sincere tear is all it takes. That's what he promises. So any final thoughts from anyone? Any questions, comments, your own experiences, your own wisdom? Um, one point I forgot, um, and that is the uh, chapter two verses, uh, let me see here. Uh, Verses 55 through 72, chapter 2, Sthita Pragna, all the characteristics of a person of stable wisdom that Krishna describes there exactly as if, you know, all the repetition in different words are in Bhakti Yoga too. But the reason when I was reading commentary on Gita by different scholars, one very important point somebody made, I forget the name, repetitions are purposeful because the, uh, the intention of the Gita, unlike other Upanishads, was to reach the most ordinary person average person and not scholars and academics. Or so in different words and in different ways, Krishna teaches Arjuna, you know, by circulating the ideas in different ways. But yes. Bottom line is that Nishka Karma, whatever you do, at least you cannot do anything do selfless work and offer the fruits to me. Yes. With devotion, either tapa, japa, whatever way. And if, if, if you, as, as you're pointing out, Uma, it's yeah. in chapter two. Yeah. And if you, what you can do, if, if one wishes, yeah. one can read chapters two through six yeah. over and over until you really have assimilated it. You really have done the manana have yeah, us, and assimilated it. And I, the whole truth of the Gita yeah. is in the rest, is in those six chapters. The rest is elaboration. And so we have elaborated this morning on, uh, we've, we've, Sri Krishna elaborated on the path of devotion. And he says that those who follow it have the greater understanding of yoga. And Sri, Sri Ramakrishna also says that the path of bhakti is the proper path for this time. Thank you, Uma. Anything else from anyone? All right, dears. Well, next month we'll take up karma yoga, but I'm going to start the month with uh, a talk that has been given before that changes a little bit each time on Halloween. Today is Halloween. Halloween has its roots in the worship of Kali. 
very surprising because of the diffusion of these ideas out of India into Europe and into the Celtic countries especially. Uh, we see the direct link and it has to do with astronomical phenomena, not astrological, but astronomical phenomena. There is astrolo There are astrological aspects. So next week we'll talk about that. And then because uh, there is a great deal of the Jewish calendar is in November, we will talk about the Baal Shem Tov and his teachings. Uh, the Baal Shem Tov means master of the great word or the, the divine word. Uh, he was a Jewish mystic and reformer. Uh, so we'll, but we'll talk about that from the Karma Yoga perspective, what he taught as a Karma Yogi in November. So any final thoughts from anyone? All right, let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth and in the waters. Let there be peace in the herbs, the plants and the trees. May the gods be peaceful. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. Let that infinite universal peace prevail throughout my being. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace. Peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. And of course, Jai Sri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai, Durga, Durga, Durga. May we be safe, may we be healthy, may we be cheerful, may we have peace of mind, may we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. Any oh, final thought from anyone? Uh, Brother Shankara. Yes, dear. I forgot uh, for all my Indian friends, Diwali starts this week. Diwali, five days of uh, Krishna's victory over evil. So these are all over in India, throughout India celebrated. And of course, here also, <coughs> they have started celebrating Diwali in various schools here. So that week starts uh, coming. Monday through Sunday. Thank you, Uma. Um, uh, I'll bet you not one of your Indian friends didn't know that, but the rest of us now know it too. <laughs> That's the purpose. <laughs> yes, I know, dear. Uh, so as Tom Carr pointed out, there are usually more than one motivation. There's usually more than one motivation yeah. for our actions and our speech. So, uh, it's so delightful to be with you this morning. Happy uh, the next opportunity to be together will be tomorrow evening where we have our reading and discussion group on Love Poems from God. Tuesday, we're coming close to the end of the book on Holy Mother's Life, uh, studying Swami Chitananda's wonderful Sri Sharda Devi, her divine play. And then uh, on Wednesday evening at eight o'clock, we're just about to end chapter 13 of Swami Vivekananda's Jnana Yoga and start chapter 14. Uh, the, the end of uh, the chapter 13, which is titled Immortality, is action packed. So if you care to join us for Wednesday night, um, you will hear some very inspiring words indeed. 
And then, of course, next Saturday, we study Swami Prabhupada's Realizing God. And on the following Sunday, next Sunday, there'll be this talk on the genesis and, uh, and meaning, true deep meaning of our celebration of Halloween. So may you all be well and in bright spirits. Until next time. Thank you, Brother Shikra. Thank you, dears. Sayonara.